So crazy is the Macro Mafia, everyone had to die. From an Ajax youth player to one of the country's most notorious criminals, he narrowly escaped death numerous times, only to be fatally shot with 80 bullets in the end. One of the key figures in Macro Mafia that has troubled the Netherlands for decades. Ever wondered what could drive a promising youth athlete down such a dark path? What twists and turns could lead someone from the hollowed grounds of a football pitch to the shadowy alleys of organized crime? Well, this is the story of Gwyneth Martha, a tale of ambition, betrayal, and ultimately tragic demise. Today, I delve into the heart of the Dutch underworld, the epicenter of the Macro Mafia, and explore its far-reaching impact on both civilians and authorities. This is the story of a man without a shadow, who broke out of prison, remained a main figure about the infamous Macro Mafia war, and survived attempts on his life before his criminal career caught up with him. Welcome to the dark side of the Dutch, where the vibrant streets of Amsterdam conceal a shadowy underworld teeming with intrigue and danger. Welcome to the world of Macro Mafia. Rise of the Dark Prince How did Gwinnett Martha ascend to criminal kingpin status? Ever wondered about the murky origins of the infamous Macro Mafia War? What dark undercurrents preceded the explosive events of 2012? It all started with Gwinnett Martha, a petty criminal turned gang kingpin who kept playing the cat and mouse game with the law enforcement throughout his life. Forced to flee their home country due to his father's alcoholism, Gwinnett, along with his brother and mother, sought refuge in Amsterdam. But as they faced the challenges of settling into their new life, Gwinnett's childhood passion for football provided solace. He started playing for Ajax soon. Despite his prowess on the field, off-field pursuits soon captivated his attention, leading him and his brother Giovanni into a world of trouble in their neighborhood of Depep. While Giovanni was hot-headed, Gwinnett was shrewd and strategic, but the sibling duo was inseparable. Both delved deep into the dark alleys of the crime world as the time passed. Here, we witness the convergence of circumstance and choice, a theme that resonates throughout Gwinnett's life. While the rough neighborhood and harsh economic conditions may have provided fertile ground for criminal activity, it was ultimately Gwinnett's own decisions and inclinations that propelled him down the path of crime. But what do you think? Is it the external environment or individual choices that should bear the responsibility for criminal behavior? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. As Gwinnett's criminal pursuits evolved from petty crimes to street gang activities, the lid was closed on his promising Ajax career. Yet, it's essential to recognize that Gwinnett's journey into crime was not solely dictated by external factors. Rather, his strategic mindset and personal choices played a significant role in shaping his criminal trajectory. So what factors do you believe influence an individual's decision to engage in criminal behavior? Is it primarily the circumstances they find themselves in, or do personal choices and predispositions play a more significant role? Fast forward to March 5th, 1992, a fateful night that would forever alter Gwinnett's life. Just a month after celebrating his 18th birthday, tragedy struck him. Gwinnett and his gang members were hanging out in Club Escape, a popular venue in the center of Amsterdam. They got into a heated altercation with a rival gang from Amsterdam West. The club scene of Amsterdam's nightlife becomes a backdrop for the clash between rival gangs, underscoring the tension and violence simmering beneath the city's glamorous facade. During the confrontation, shots were fired by Muhammad Mumi C. at Giovanni, who tragically succumbed to his injuries in the arms of his older brother, Gwinnett. This devastating loss ignited a thirst for vengeance within Gwinnett, setting the stage for his transformation into a formidable figure within Amsterdam's criminal underworld. How do you perceive Gwinnett's response to his brother's death? Was his quest for revenge justified, or did it further perpetuate the cycle of violence? However, Marth hadn't just sat fuming during this time. He had a productive use for his pent-up energy. During this time, he had well-established his gang in the illicit market, delving into coke and the emerging ecstasy trade. During this time, Najib Boo Boo 
known as the mayor, became his most trusted gang member and a best friend who was just like a brother to him. The name is very important in the history of Macro Mafia and in this story as well, so remember it, for it will come in handy later. Nevertheless, after 11 years of patience, Martha got the opportunity to avenge his little brother. On the 14th of October, 2003, Mumi lost his life in the coffee shop named Ruthless in Groningen. However, the elimination couldn't be traced to Gwinnett and hence he walked free, at least for that time. On the other hand, the Martha clan asserted dominance over Amsterdam's illicit market within a decade, but as history teaches, empires often crumble from within. Enter Hussein Aitsusan, alias Hose, a trusted friend turned rogue whose actions would send shockwaves through the criminal underworld. While both Martha and Hose shared a passion for futsal and loyalty, resentment lurked beneath the surface. Now, here's another name to remember. Just like before, let it stick in your mind because it's gonna make a comeback later on. Trust me, you're not gonna wanna miss it. A man without a shadow, how long did he dance with the law? For now, you may be thinking, how did a booming gang like this evade law enforcement's watchful gaze? The truth is, they didn't. Gwinnett Martha faced brushes with the law, although he managed to evade conviction for a time. His gang had evolved from petty crimes to engaging in illicit trade and violent robberies. Initially targeting stores, they soon escalated to bank heists, catching the attention of the Dutch police. A significant investigation into Martha and his associates led to his arrest. Prosecutors deemed his criminal activities severe, seeking a 10-year jail sentence for Gwinnett due to the robberies. However, he ultimately served only a year and a half for possession of weapons and involvement in illicit trade. Despite appearing on the police radar, Martha's ambitions remain undeterred. The proceeds from their robberies were reinvested in contraband shipments, yielding substantial profits used for luxury items such as watches, designer clothing, and lavish club outings. The sudden influx of wealth raised suspicions, prompting a renewed investigation into Martha's activities. A 24-7 surveillance team was deployed to monitor his movements closely. However, Gwinnett, known as the man without a shadow, proved elusive to capture. Aware of the surveillance, Gwinnett swiftly detected a tractor placed under his car. In a cunning move, he retrieved the device and discreetly planted it beneath the surveillance team's vehicle, causing confusion among investigators. The incident left the observation team perplexed. Inadvertently trailing one of their own members instead of their intended target, highlighting Martha's shrewdness and ability to outsmart law enforcement. This instance highlights the cat and mouse game between law enforcement and organized crime, illustrating how criminal enterprises adapt to evade capture. Despite being under constant surveillance, Gwinnett Martha demonstrates a remarkable ability to outmaneuver authorities, showcasing the challenges faced by law enforcement in apprehending elusive criminals. The case also sheds light on the lucrative nature of illicit activities and the lengths individuals will go to protect their operations. However, this is just one example of Gwen and Martha's cunning. According to the surveillance team, he would often taunt them by waving or winking as he passed them on the streets, making it clear that their covert surveillance wasn't as covert as they thought. In a bold move, he once outfitted his car with a blue siren identical to the ones used by the observation team, a brazen display intended to mock their efforts and assert his awareness of their operation. Unlike typical criminals, Martha was meticulous in his actions, avoiding phone calls that could be intercept and taking precautions against vehicle tractors by installing jammers. Despite Martha's efforts to evade detection, the surveillance team eventually caught a breakthrough in March 2007 when they observed him receiving a large black bag at a gas station, which he then transported to his girlfriend Malika Kay's residence. A subsequent police search of Malika Kay's home on April 3rd uncovered two watches valued at 100,000 euros and a significant amount of cash. Following this discovery, Martha was arrested during a search of another frequented residence. 
During his trial, Martha attempted to explain his apparent wealth by claiming income by selling cannabis and operating a clothing store in Amsterdam. However, the judge remained unconvinced, ultimately sentencing him to seven years in prison in 2008. Yet, Martha's determination to evade the law knew no bounds. Crafting a daring escape plan from the moment he entered prison, Martha executed his plan with precision, disappearing without a trace and leaving authorities baffled until October 2009. Gwinnett Martha's ability to outsmart law enforcement not only underscores his cunning, but also highlights the challenges faced by authorities in combating organized crime. His taunting gestures towards the surveillance team demonstrate a brazen confidence and a willingness to flaunt his illicit activities in plain sight, reflecting a deeper sense of impunity within criminal circles. Moreover, Martha's meticulous precautions against surveillance tactics reveal a level of sophistication uncommon among typical criminals, raising questions about the resources and networks that enable such individuals to operate with relative impunity. But what transpired within his criminal clan during his absence from the streets and the walls of prison? Gwinnett's right-hand man, best friend become brother, Najib Bubu, was spending a lot of time in Antwerp, forging alliances with local gangs, including the Turtles. He was chosen as the main handler of the clan's affairs by Martha in the Kingpin's absence. Why Antwerp, you ask? Well, it's not just any port city. It's a bustling hub of activity, with lax security ripe for exploitation. Meanwhile, Martha needed a place to lay low, and what better location than one conducive to business and where his best friend was already established? He decided on Antwerp as his refuge. Now, imagine Gwinnett, fresh from his daring escape, seamlessly integrating into the fabric of Antwerp's criminal landscape. With a staggering 200,000 euros lining his pockets weekly, it seemed like a perfect haven. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. As the Dutch and Belgian authorities closed in, tensions simmered within the Martha clan. Bubu's entrustment with the mantle of leadership in Gwinnett's absence made Hussein resentful. The resentment ultimately led to conflict and then parting ways. The divide was palpable, which led to splitting of the clan into two warring factions, Martha versus Hose. Hussein formed his own shipping line with his brother-in-law, Benau Fave, and then the spark that ignited the inferno, a brazen theft of 200 to 300 kilograms of coke from the Antwerp port, fingers pointing accusingly at the turtles. Amidst the chaos, violence erupted, leaving a trail of confusion and anger in its wake. It was a powder keg waiting to explode, with two rival factions on the brink of an all-out war. What sparked the flames of the Macro Mafia War? Now imagine the tension thickening as accusations flew, fingers pointed, and alliances shattered. Could one coke theft ignite a long chaotic gang war? The answer is yes. Gangland is like a tinderbox waiting for a single spark to set it ablaze, and this stolen consignment proved to be that spark. The Martha clan found themselves in the crosshairs, blamed for orchestrating the heist and disrupting the delicate balance of power. As the turtles were considered mere pawns in a much larger game, manipulated by unseen hands. Enter Gwyneth Martha, still incarcerated but pulling the strings from behind bars. With his right-hand man, Boo Boo, dispatched to Antwerp in a bid for reconciliation, the stage was set for a deadly showdown. Little did Bo know, his fate was sealed the moment he stepped foot into the Crown Plaza Hotel. In a chilling act of betrayal, Bo met his end in a cold-blooded elimination orchestrated by none other than Benau Fay. It was a message, a warning shot fired in the escalating war between the Martha and Ho's factions. And so, with blood staining the streets and vengeance coursing through their veins, the infamous Macro Mafia war was born, a feud that would echo through the decades to come, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. At this juncture, everything was allowed and the era of negotiation had unequivocally ended. 
The only rule of the war was that there would be no rules. Group Gwyneth was poised to retaliate with unprecedented ferocity. What was meticulously planned as a covert operation spiraled into a catastrophic failure. The events of December 29, 2012 marked an unprecedented occurrence in the Netherlands, reshaping the nation's perception of organized crime. At approximately 10.30 p.m., four individuals awaited a rendezvous in a Range Rover with French registration plates in Amsterdam's Stadsliedenburg. The occupants included Sed Al Yazidi, Yusuf Lorf, Benal Fay, and Rita Benajem, still evading capture for the Crown Plot a crime. Suddenly, a Silverado RS4 raced towards them, multiple assailants targeting the car. The Range Rover sustained over 50 bullet impacts. Said El Yazidi and Yusuf Lorf lost their lives, but Benalf, the actual target, and Rita managed to evade capture. Benalf resorted to diving into the water between two houseboats to evade his pursuers. The perpetrators, including Adile Anwar B., and Hamza B gave chase but eventually abandoned their search. A bystander later extended assistance to Benalf, mistaking his presence in the water as an accident. She offered him a towel and a cup of tea, but Benalf declined and vanished into the night. Adile, Anwar B and Hamza B ceased their pursuit, recognizing the futility of their efforts, and hastily departed the scene. Subsequently, two police officers on motorbikes engaged in pursuit of the silver Audi RS4. The situation escalated when two occupants of the Audi opened fire, compelling the officers to take cover behind their vehicles, fearing for their lives. This pivotal moment sent shockwaves across the nation, underscoring the perilous nature of the Macro feud and revealing a new breed of impulsive and reckless criminals. Despite the successful escape of Adile, Anwar B, and Hamza B, the mission's primary objective remained unfulfilled. Ben Elf emerged unscathed and emboldened to exact his revenge. However, the war was far from over. There were numerous execution attempts from both sides, resulting in casualties or incarcerations. However, this relentless conflict continued to escalate even as the original investigators were eliminated or imprisoned. The war attracted additional players seeking power and control over territory, expanding its initial origins. But amidst this turmoil, what became of Gwinnett? Martha's End In the midst of the chaos and bloodshed, Gwyneth Martha still reigned as the undisputed King of Amsterdam, his grip on the city's coke market unyielding. But even kings are not immune to the specter of death. Let's delve into the events leading to Gwyneth Martha's demise. Along with his incarceration and extradition to the Netherlands in 2009, he was ordered to pay back 16 million euros to the Dutch government for money laundering. Notably, the Dutch laws don't punish for escaping prison. Otherwise, Gwyneth would have been slapped with additional years of prison. Countries like Belgium, Germany, Sweden, Austria, the Netherlands, and other countries do not punish for prison escapes on the grounds that it's human nature to want to escape. So someone who doesn't break any other law would not be charged or given extra time of sentence for their attempt to escape prison. After serving a four-year jail sentence, Gwyneth Martha was released, but his troubles were far from over. In 2013, an attempt on Martha's life sent shockwaves through his world, plunging him into a state of paranoia. While strolling through Amsterdam South with a friend, an unidentified man held a weapon to his head and pulled the trigger multiple times, only for the weapon to jam. After a brief scuffle, the assailant fled the scene. What Martha did next is going to shock you. He went over to the police station, filed a police report, and requested police protection, a rare move in gangland circles. Imagine being a kingpin, an arch enemy of the legal system, and then seeking protection from the same system. However, he couldn't get what he wanted. His lack of cooperation during interrogation led to the denial of his request for protection. 
How do you view Martha's decision to approach the police for protection in the context of loyalty to his criminal world versus prioritizing his own self-preservation? Do you believe loyalty to the underworld rules should take precedence over personal safety in such precarious situations? Despite the assailant remaining unidentified, Martha suspected the involvement of a former friend, Alex Alecki Gillis. In response to the ongoing threat to his life, Martha ordered a hit on Gillis, which proved successful. Despite this, Martha's paranoia persisted as the threat to his life remained unresolved. He would emerge from the shadows only with a bodyguard and the protection of a bulletproof vest. Yet fate, relentless as ever, caught up with him in 2014 on the streets of Amsterdam. Ironically, Martha only came out without a bulletproof vest with those he trusted, and it was one of those occasions. In May 2014, he was sitting with his bodyguard and an associate in a shawarma shop in Amstelveen. He was hit 80 times and his associate fled, which makes his role suspicious. Was he in on the whole plan? He knew that Martha wasn't wearing the bulletproof vest, which was a rare occasion. Did he tip off his enemies and played a role in his trusting boss's elimination? What do you think? But the demise of Gwyneth really makes you wonder how fickle the world of gangland is. A man who earned a reputation of a man with no shadow, managed to escape prison, survived an attack on his life, was ahead of his enemies, and the law enforcement most of the times finally met death. The sheer brutality of the incident serves as a grim indication of the callous disregard for human life that permeates the criminal underworld. This orchestrated onslaught is a chilling reminder of the lengths to which rival factions will go to settle vendettas and assert dominance. In the murky realm of true crime, where power struggles and vendettas unfold in shadows, such brazen displays of force not only instill fear in rival factions, but also send a chilling message to law enforcement agencies tasked with upholding public safety. It's a constant battle between the forces of law and the insidious machinations of organized crime, where every move is calculated and every decision carries profound consequences. However, the demise of the Kingpin did little to quell the flames of the ongoing gang war. If anything, it only fueled the conflict, drawing more players into the fray. The Martha clan persisted, their exploits continuing to make headlines as the saga unfolded. Yet, with time, the once formidable organization began to splinter, its members branching out into other ventures or meeting their demise behind bars or in the streets. The incarcerated have attempted to get out. Take Ben Al Fay, for example. Ben Al Fay, in prison for the murder of Boo Boo in 2014. An audacious escape plan involving a hijacked helicopter aimed to liberate him from captivity. However, swift police intervention thwarted the police, resulting in the apprehension of the would-be perpetrators. This anecdote provides insight into the resilience and resourcefulness of criminal networks, emphasizing the ongoing cat and mouse game between law enforcement and organized crime. What's more, despite the absence of the main figures of the Macro Mafia War, the gang feuds within the Mafia still rage on. As previous actors fade into the background, new ones emerge to take their place. Can the Dutch authorities stem the tide of the growing narco threat? Are there any glimmers of hope on the horizon for Dutch citizens amidst this unyielding turmoil? The answer to these pressing questions will undoubtedly shape the future of Dutch society.